being here at 8.30 on the final day of the conference. Uh, I have to say the day must begin with uh, congratulating the European Space Agency on the successful touchdown and end of the uh, Rosetta mission operations. Hope you all had a chance to be here earlier or watch the video. It's uh, always fun. So uh, today um, we're going to take you to a new frontier, a very important um, and likely historic quest that is the search for uh, what life is, where it may be, and how it got to be there in diverse locations throughout our solar system. Something that we really didn't have the prospect of being able to do just a few short decades ago and uh, but which now really tempts us and gives us a threshold to cross over. So uh, I'd like to um, say a few uh, logistics things first. Uh, one is the topic of Ocean Worlds, which Jonathan will talk about, is, uh, is an emerging one, uh, and as I said, an important one. You'll see in the call for papers for Adelaide, uh, symposium um, A.7, I suppose it is, uh, it explicitly invites papers on the topic of ocean worlds, and I encourage you to come to Adelaide and engage in that discussion. Uh, and this afternoon, actually, uh, session A7.3 uh, is about uh, technologies to enable future missions. So uh, it's with really uh, great pleasure that I get to introduce Jonathan Lunin, a uh, colleague and friend uh, Jonathan is the David C. Duncan Professor of the Physical Sciences at Cornell University and Director of the Cornell Center for Astrophysics and Planetary Science. He's also the David Baltimore Distinguished Visiting Scientist at NASA's JPL. Author of over 290 refereed papers, Jonathan is interested in how planets form and evolve, what processes maintain and establish habitability, and where life occurs in the solar system. He pursues his research through theoretical modeling and participation in spacecraft missions. He works with the radar and other instruments on Cassini, continues to work on mass spectrometer data from Huygens, and is co-investigator on the Juno mission launched in 2011, which of course just arrived at Jupiter and is beginning its uh, science operations, uh, and also on the Europa mission planned for launch in 2022. He's on the science team for the James Webb Space Telescope, focusing on characterization of extrasolar planets and Kuiper Belt objects. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and has participated in or chaired a number of advisory and strategic planning committees for the Academy and for NASA. You'll find um, that there are papers circulating uh, on which you can uh, and should write questions for Jonathan uh, when he concludes his talk and uh, we hope for a very engaging uh, session. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. So I'd like to introduce my friend, Jonathan Lunin. Brent, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm gonna try to, no, I'm not gonna try to put my coffee up here. It's sloping, but it was a very late night last night, and it was a wonderful culture event, uh, beautiful music. And on the bus ride back to the hotel, I got into a conversation with someone I didn't know. And toward the end of the conversation, um, when he found out that I was a planetary scientist, he said, well, how about that Pluto? That is really fascinating, isn't it? And I found that I had the wrong reaction to that. Instead of saying, yes, you bet, it's incredible, what I wanted to say to him was, yeah, but you should come to my talk and hear about Enceladus and Titan because they're really fascinating. And then I realized that I was actually suffering from planet envy. You know, my moon is better than your moon. My planet is more interesting than your planet. <clears throat> Fortunately, it turns out that he's a psychiatrist. He's a space psychiatrist. I don't know what they do. Um, unfortunately, we had reached the end of the journey, and I didn't have time to receive free counseling from him. Uh, but on the philosophical side, that kind of response, I think, is a result of the incredible success that 
planetary exploration worldwide by many countries has had over the last almost 60 years. And if we think back to the early days of what kinds of data we got and the few objects we were visiting, and now we think today to all the missions that are going on. Rosetta just finished its spectacular mission that began in 2004 with its launch, uh, exploring this comet, giving us clues to the origin of the solar system. Cassini, uh, Cassini-Huygens, which is a NASA ESA Aussie mission, and you can see it in the middle here, was launched seven years before Rosetta and has another year to go in the Saturn system. And what I want to describe to you today is the extraordinary set of discoveries that Cassini has made at two objects, Enceladus and Titan. These two objects are um, two of the three bodies in the outer solar system that hold the, the promise for us of giving us the answer to whether there is life elsewhere in the solar system and whether that life had a second separate origin from life on Earth. If the answer turns out to be positive, it will be one of the greatest discoveries in the history of science and one that, of course, is a capstone for many centuries of speculation. So here's the message I want you to take home with you. There is one place in the solar system where we can say we know there's a habitable environment, other than the Earth, of course, and we know how to go search for life there, and that's Enceladus. Second point, there's one place in the solar system which is at once very familiar. It, there's air, there's rain, there are clouds, there are rivers, there are lakes, there are seas, but it's all exotic. All of this material that's involved in these Earth-like processes are completely different from what happens on the Earth. And so that's kind of the wild card in the search for life, and that's Saturn's moon Titan. I'll describe how and why that's a wild card. And both these bodies are part of the same satellite system, the Saturn system, which has been explored so thoroughly now by Cassini. And I will say a few words about Europa at the end, don't worry, although I talked about it more extensively on Monday in the Ocean World session. So let me start with Enceladus. It's a small moon. Uh, in fact, it's surprisingly small. You would think that, you know, this wouldn't be very interesting given how small it is relative to the, um, the Earth's moon and the Earth itself. But it turns out to be in an orbit <clears throat> that is relatively close to Saturn. And so here we see uh, Saturn with its rings and the red circle delineates the orbit of Enceladus. And so because it's close to Saturn and because it has an orbit that's not circular, it's slightly eccentric, Enceladus has uh, what's called tidal heating. Some of that orbital energy is being extracted by uh, friction, essentially, and goes into heating the interior of this body. <clears throat> now, Enceladus was first imaged by the Voyager spacecraft, 1980 and 81. It was clear at that time that something was going on. Enceladus was very bright. It had a dearth of craters. <clears throat> and indeed, uh, it had been known since the 1960s that it orbits in the path of a diffuse ring of Saturn, not shown on this figure, called the E-ring. <clears throat> and so there was always speculation that maybe material was coming out of Enceladus and producing the E-ring. But the Voyager cameras were just not sensitive enough to see anything. And so despite a lot of stretching and enhancement and so on, there was really no convincing evidence for uh, material coming out, jetting or geysering or anything like that. Cassini, having been launched in 1997, arrived in Saturn orbit in 2004. And almost immediately, the magnetometer team led at the time by David Southwood and now by Michelle Dockerty at Imperial College, found that the <clears throat> magnetic field lines of Saturn in the vicinity of Enceladus were being distorted. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they were being distorted in a way that suggested that material was pouring out of the south polar region of this small moon. And it wasn't very long after that that Cassini, uh, the, the imaging science system, 
uh, a, uh, a team led by Carolyn Porco, took images of Enceladus with the sun uh, behind it so that you were looking at forward scattering. And it took the images that you see in the lower right-hand portion of this figure. Uh, a is the original image, and B is greatly enhanced. And sure enough, there is a plume of material pouring out of the south polar region of Enceladus. And that was the source of the magnetic field distortion. Now, if you look at Enceladus um, full lit by the sun, as in the image in the upper right, what you see is that in the south polar region, there are four long lineaments, <clears throat> which were initially called tiger stripes. And then the uh, International Astronomical Union, in its infinite wisdom, decided to use the Latin term sulcus, uh, which doesn't roll off my tongue, but it's Latin for fracture. Those, I'm not going to call them sulky, I'll call them tiger stripes. Those tiger stripes are delineated, are, are truncated, I should say, by a kind of a hexagonal fracture system that circumscribes the south pole of Enceladus. And so that whole region tectonically is separate from the rest of the body. And that's where material is pouring out, gas and grains. And furthermore, later images by Cassini show that this plume has as its source discrete jets coming out of the fractures. There may be as many as 100 of them. And if you look at the highest resolution image returned by Cassini of Enceladus, this one here where this is a kilometer scale bar, you can see some of the subsidiary fractures, the secondary and tertiary ones. And if you squint really hard, you can see this little fan-shaped feature, which is an area where loose material has clearly been blown out by the escaping gas and grains. And indeed, uh, some of this material that you see along the ridge tops may also have been blown out. The gravity of Enceladus is, is very weak. Enceladus is 500 times smaller in volume than Europa. And so material can come out at slow velocity and still escape from Enceladus. Well, having seen these images, it was natural for Cassini science teams to say, um, let's go fly through the plume. Because in fact, Cassini carries with it two instruments called mass spectrometers, which directly take in particles and gas and determine the molecular or atomic weight of that material. In essence, it tastes the gas. Those mass spectrometers were not carried to the Saturn system because of Enceladus. We didn't know that there was a plume there. Remember, Cassini discovered that. They were carried, one gas mass spectrometer called INMS, led by uh, Hunter Waite, was carried to explore the um, upper atmosphere of Titan. And the other one, the CDA, the Cosmic Dust Analyzer, led by Ralph Srama from uh, Stuttgart, was carried both to look at the upper atmosphere and of Titan and also uh, uh, ring debris and uh, dust streams in the Saturn system. So we were extremely fortunate that this mission was very well instrumented to do a variety of different kinds of observations. And so it was possible to sample the plume directly. And I'll show you those results in a minute, but I also want to add that Cassini's ultraviolet spectrometer was able to analyze some of the plume composition. And uh, there were a number of other instruments that contributed to this exploration of this remarkable feature of Enceladus. So let me go to the mass spectrometry. 2008. Um, there had already been several flybys of the plume. There were seven in total up through October of last year. Uh, this was done after very careful analysis by the project of the safety factors, the risk associated with doing this. And the mass spectrometry data revealed some interesting things. So the figure that I'm showing here is not a mass spectrum. It's a cartoon drawn based on a mass spectrum. And what you see is the mass given here in atomic mass units and the signal over here. So for those of you who don't remember your elementary chemistry, in atomic mass units, molecular hydrogen has a mass of 2, carbon has a mass of 12, water has a mass of 18, and so forth. 
And so colorized on here are the various uh, peaks that have been isolated and analyzed to determine that there is water in the plume, that's the blue, the green is methane and ammonia, the red is carbon dioxide, and then there are organics containing two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, and six carbons. So the plume of Enceladus carries with it organic molecules, carbon-bearing molecules, and nitrogen-bearing molecules, and hydrogen along with it, as well as the water, which was detected in several ways. Now, there are a number of organic species that may fit these various mass ranges. These mass spectrometers, for example, the CDA and, and the INMS both, were designed in the 1990s, 1980s actually. Uh, the INMS, for example, uh, was actually built uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center by Hasso Niemann, who had built the Huygens probe mass spectrometer, gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. These were the state of the art for space flight in the 1990s, but they have limited mass range and limited mass resolution. And so all they can do is tell you what's called the unitary mass of each of these species. It will tell you whether something is mass 28 or mass 27, but it won't tell you whether it's mass 28.0043. Now, why should these species have fractional masses? Because when you bind atoms together in a nucleus, some of that mass either is taken away or added as part of the binding energy. And uh, this is called the mass defect. And so at much higher mass resolution, you can actually determine fractional masses and separate out all of these species that are currently ambiguous. But not with Cassini because of the design of those mass spectrometers. And that is in no way a criticism of the Cassini instruments. We're talking about instruments that uh, in essence through their design are 25 years old uh, and worked beautifully. <clears throat> so there are organics in the plume, but even in 2008, three years after the discovery of the plume, there was a lot of discussion and argument about what the source region of the plume and the jets really was. Was it an ocean or was it just warm ice? Maybe it's a gas hydrate that uh, very much like uh, 67P, the comet that Rosetta explored, uh, the material gets heated up and the gas is released from the ice. That would be interesting, but not very interesting. The clue that led to the conclusion that the jets are coming from the ocean really came from the CDA data, the second mass spectrometer, which showed that sodium and potassium salts are present in the grains some of the grains coming out in the plume. And indeed, the larger the grains, the more salt is present. The largest grains that were analyzed, <clears throat> five microns or so in size, have upwards of 2% salinity. That's within a factor of two of the salinity of the oceans of the Earth. That high a salt content requires that the salt have been dissolved in liquid water at the beginning, because ice doesn't hold salt at that level. Salt's not very soluble in ice. So the, the salt is pointing us to the conclusion that the ice grains coming out, at least the largest ones, are frozen seawater coming up from some interior, as in this uh, depiction by Kite and Rubin, through fractures in the ice shell and blowing out into space. And so the CDA data, which were published by Postberg et al., tell us that Cassini has been sampling liquid water, salty liquid water with organics from a subsurface ocean on Enceladus. So what is the evidence for that ocean besides the salt grains? Well, again, Cassini is uh, a remarkable machine. I call it a discovery machine, not because it's part of the discovery program. It's a flagship mission. But Cassini keeps making discovery after discovery after discovery. And as small as Enceladus is, Cassini was able to tell us that it has a global ocean in two different ways. One way was using very precise measurements of the changes in the spacecraft velocity as Cassini flew by Enceladus repeatedly. 
And those changes in velocity measurable literally to um, millimeters per second on flybys of kilometers per second. Those measurements combined with the shape of Enceladus indicated that there is a region of slightly higher density underneath the water ice. Now, from Voyager and Spectra from the Earth, it was known that Enceladus had a water ice surface. When Cassini flew by, it was possible to accurately measure the overall density, the mass over volume of Enceladus, which is about 60% greater than that of, of water ice. And so evidently, Enceladus has a very extensive rocky core. So there's ice on the outside, rock on the inside, but in the south polar region, based on these data, there's a lens of slightly denser material, which the only explanation can be liquid water. And so that's the liquid water ocean. And that was first published by Luciano Yes and colleagues from University of Rome, who led the analysis. Uh, Bill McKinnon, uh, Washington University, then uh, did a more detailed analysis and concluded that the ocean is global, but it's thickest at the South Pole. And then, because Cassini has been in the Saturn system for so long, Peter Thomas of the imaging team and colleagues were able to map out the nodding motion, the libration of Enceladus as it moves around in its non-circular orbit over many years. The orbit is very short, just days, but the nodding motion requires years to actually um, to work out. And that nodding is caused by the fact that in an eccentric orbit, the moon is moving fastest at its closest point to Saturn. It's moving slower at its farthest point. And so even though it tries to keep one face towards Saturn all the time, it's actually nodding back and forth. The amplitude of that nodding, which by the way, we can see in our own Earth's moon, the amplitude of that for Enceladus was much larger than what you would expect for a body of the mass of Enceladus. The only real explanation for this is that the part of Enceladus that's nodding back and forth is not the entire mass of the satellite. It's just the decoupled shell. It's the thin ice shell on top of all the rest of the mass. And uh, in that way, because that's much less massive than the total body itself, Saturn's gravity can cause it to slide back and forth with a much greater amplitude than uh, the whole body could. And so that was a second independent determination of an ocean because how can the shells slide relative to the rest of the body? There must be a liquid layer between that outer ice shell and the interior. So Cassini in two different ways has shown us that there's an ocean on Enceladus. In the interior, about 30 kilometers below the surface. 2015, the CDA mass spectrometer had detected over several passes very tiny nanometer-sized silica grains, very rich, almost pure silica, SiO2, coming out of Enceladus. Now, how could that happen? Well, the best uh, explanation based on the data and laboratory and theoretical studies in a paper published last year by Shu et al., uh, part of the CDA team, is that these silica grains, tiny grains, are actually colloidal suspensions in the water. Now, why would there be a colloidal suspension of silica? Well, in that model I showed you in the last slide, the ocean is sandwiched in between the ice and the silicate core. And it has to be, because the pressure in Enceladus's interior is too small for high pressure ice to occur. And so once you get liquid water, <clears throat> the bottom of that must terminate, the ocean must terminate at the silicate core. So there's liquid water cycling through fractures in the core, picking up silica, dissolving it at the higher temperatures in the core. The core is probably heated both by tides and radiogenic heating the decay of radioactive isotopes in the rock, that hot water comes back out into the ocean and it cools. And as it cools, the silica is no longer soluble. And so it precipitates out into a suspension. And then the remarkable thing is that rather than having time to drift to the ocean floor or to agglomerate into bigger particles, it gets shot out quickly enough that the original size distribution is maintained. So we learned two things from these observations. One is that 
water is cycling through hot rock, picking up minerals and salts, and that would be expected because, again, Cassini detected salts in the ice grains. And number two, some of that material in these hydrothermal zones is getting out really quickly and um, getting out through conduits in the crust quickly enough that this agglomeration cannot occur. So Cassini made its last fly through of the plume at 49 kilometers in October of last year. And uh, it left behind a remarkable list of characteristics of the material in this plume. And I haven't talked about the remote sensing data, but all of that goes into this package as well. And all of the, f the things that Cassini found tell us that this ocean is, in a general sense, habitable. That if you threw bacteria into it, which we don't want to do, uh, those bacteria would, would be viable. They would live. The ocean is salty. The ocean has organic molecules. Something I didn't talk about, which was presented by Hunter Wade and the INMS team at the AGU last year, is that there's evidence for hydrogen, which is evidence for active reaction of the water with the rock in the interior. There are energy sources. The Cassini infrared instrument measured gigawatts of power coming out of the fractures. And there's a hydrothermal system at the ocean base. And most importantly, all of these data were collected as free samples, flying through the plume seven times with mass spectrometers not designed to do it, collecting this material and analyzing it. And uh, is there life? Well, unfortunately, the Cassini instruments don't have the resolution and they don't have the mass range to analyze biomolecules. So what do we do next? Well, whenever I talk about this to people, they say, well, let's put a lander on the surface. Um, and if you look at the cost of landers, they're all in the $2 billion range, roughly speaking. Now, that's the cost of a flagship mission. And if we think about what's going to happen uh, after Cassini, there's already a flagship mission in planning to go to Europa, the Europa multi-flyby mission. Uh, there may be a Europa lander uh, which would also be launched to Europa. Uh, that together with the uh, flyby part would make a Cassini class flagship, a large flagship. And so the reality is that um, no nation, the US or the European Space Agency or, or any other, is really gonna fly a second flagship in a reasonable time frame to Enceladus. So we need to think about missions in the, com the competed class uh, of the NASA program. Uh, or the European program, and NASA, Discovery or New Frontiers, uh, in Europe, the medium class program, uh, what's up to M5 right now. So what can we do in that program? Well, one possibility is, which some people want to do, is to fly through the plume and bring material back to the Earth. My view is that this is premature, and it's premature because we don't yet know what kinds of biological molecules are present, what kind of clues there are to life, and how those need to be preserved. So um, one of the issues about this kind of sample return is that unlike returning Mars samples, where you can keep the material at minus 20 Celsius or maybe even 20 Celsius, uh, there are clues in the Enceladus ocean that will degrade unless you keep the temperature very, very low. And so a, a, a seven-year trip or whatever back from Saturn to the Earth uh, would require very, very elaborate mechanisms to maintain the integrity of the sample and to monitor that integrity. And the other, which not everyone agrees with me on this, is that I have my doubts that any agency would sponsor the return of a biologically viable sample to the Earth, at least on a Class B mission, one that's not a flagship. Um, you know, we did see one discovery mission uh, with a return capsule genesis uh, malfunction and crash on the surface. Some of that material was released. Uh, the science was recovered heroically. But I think that sample return of a biologically viable sample, a class five uh, uh, planetary protection mission, is more likely to be a flagship mission. And so that actually leaves us with flying through the plume, but doing all the measurements in situ. Don't bring stuff back to the Earth. 
Do exactly what Cassini did. Exactly what Cassini did. Use Cassini as the trailblazer, but do it with instruments that we can build today and fly in space. We're 25 years on from the Cassini instruments, and there are much more accurate and much more sensitive instruments available today. So back in the last discovery round, a group of us uh, proposed through JPL a mission called Enceladus Life Finder, or ELF. Um, for those of you uh, here who speak German, uh, ELF is also the um, word for 11, and I counted <clears throat> that um, there have been 11 missions, including that one to the Saturn system. I think at, at the outer solar system. I have to fudge it a bit. But Enceladus Life Finder is the name of the mission. And what we would do is to fly through the Enceladus plume, just like Cassini did, but do it with the instruments of today. And what instruments would we carry? We would carry mass spectrometers. So what I'm going to describe to you now is a concept a discovery class mission which didn't make it to step two, but not because of the science. And the science, I think, is very solid, so do the people who reviewed it, and I want to suggest to you that this type of mission is the fastest track way and the most robust way to answer the question of whether there is biological activity going on today in the ocean of Enceladus, an ocean that we know exists, an ocean that we know is habitable. So why mass spectrometry? <clears throat> um, typical shot glass is about 20 grams of water, but when you fly through the plume of Enceladus once, you get about a microgram of water ice, which is a small amount. And so you need techniques that can analyze very, very small amounts of material, and mass spectrometry is that technique. One needs high cadence at Enceladus, because although I've talked about the jets as coming from the ocean, there is some evidence that material is also coming up from the warm crust in between the fractures. And so you want an instrument that can tell you what the spatial variability is in the composition of that material as you move along the plume. In fact, the last flyby, E21, showed evidence of that. So mass spectrometry, again, can collect material and analyze it in very, very brief periods. Boom, 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 boom. So that we would get kilometers resolution on the material. Mass spectrometry has high technical readiness. It is a technique that has been used throughout the solar system uh, from Pioneer Venus, to Viking, to Galileo, to the Huygens probe. Uh, there is extensive experience with mass spectrometry, and it is relatively simple and very robust. Now, the clue to using mass spectrometry to diagnose material is that when there's a lot of material, <clears throat> you need high mass resolution. You also need to understand how to select mass ranges in such a way that you can um, focus on those species that you know you want to see and that you can identify and pull out of the forest of lines. And that is something that mass spectrometrists do all the time. With respect to the resolution issue, let me just show you one example of what can be done with the ELF mass spectrometer. Uh, the ELF mass spectrometer is called mass specs. Uh, this is the gas mass spectrometer that will be flown. The PI for that instrument is Hunter Waite. He's the deputy PI in the ELF mission. Uh, mass specs is being flown as well on the Europa multi-flyby mission. We will fly essentially the same model. And if you look at the left-hand panel, which is a mass spectrum, mass in atomic mass units versus the signal, you see at mass 28, outlined here by the red bar, you see a signal. That's at the Cassini resolution, which tells you there are molecules there of mass 28. Now, if you go to the periodic table, you start figuring out what molecules have a unitary mass of 28 based on the atomic masses of the elements. You can pick carbon monoxide, you can pick nitrogen, you can pick ethylene, C2H4. They all have mass 28, and you can't distinguish them in the Cassini data. But if you increase the mass resolution by a factor of 80 in this case, now, because the binding energies of the nuclei are different, 
you can separate out by the fractional mass, the mass defect, carbon monoxide from nitrogen, and ethylene is way over where the floating astronaut is on this scale. So with mass spectrometry, we can remove the ambiguities from Cassini, and by extending the mass range and extending the sensitivity, we can go after biologically significant molecules. And so ELF would use mass specs, and ELF would use a dust mass spectrometer designed to analyze the ice grains. Uh, this is uh, called Anija, and it is a version of an instrument that will be flown as well on the Europa mission called SUDA. Uh, the PI for that is Sasha Kempf at the University of Colorado. So the objectives of the ELF mission are threefold. If we're going to go back to Enceladus, we need to do what I would call some good, honest planetary science, which is to understand the evolution of Enceladus through time, to look at key molecules that tell us what the environment was in which Enceladus formed. And along with doing that, we're going to look and measure species that will tell us in detail about the habitability of the Enceladus ocean. I'll get to that in a minute and we will test for evidence of life. So what about the habitability? There are a number of different parameters that one would like to know to assess the state of the ocean and its ability to not only sustain life, but to sustain the chemistry that would form life. One of these is temperature. Another is the amount of energy available from having molecules of uh, reduced and oxidized states that life or precursors to life can utilize to um, generate energy, to build structures, and to replicate. The overall oxidation state of the ocean uh, is it way over on the reduced side where uh, you would only have methane? Is it way over on the oxidized side where you only have carbon dioxide? <clears throat> or as in the case of the Earth's oceans, are we kind of in the middle where organic molecules can be synthesized? And the pH, is it very acidic, is it very alkaline? The suggestions from Cassini are that it's a very alkaline ocean, but that may be the hot material, the hot water that's coming out of these hydrothermal vents, much in analogy with uh, what are called off-axis hydrothermal systems in the Earth's oceans. One example, the type example is called the Lost City, Here's a little carbonate tower from there. That has a pH of 10. Enceladus is 10 to 12. So you can plot <clears throat> this material on a kind of a parameter space of temperature, uh, al uh, acidity or alkalinity, that's pH, oxidation state, and the fourth axis would be the redox energy. And you can plot contours of goodness of habitability. Green is really good and gray is not so good. And basically, the lost city might plot somewhere here. I haven't put any numbers on these, but the basic idea is that we know the lost city hydrothermal system on the Earth supports a healthy ecosystem and may be a model, actually, for the kind of place where life began on the Earth. Everything we see about Enceladus, particularly if this alkaline fluid is coming from the hot water that's ejecting these silica grains, makes it seem like it's kind of like the lost city hydrothermal system. But we only have crude estimates, and so we really need to go back and make the measurements required to, uh, to, to in detail, tell us what the properties of the ocean are. Now, of course, the real holy grail in this is whether there's evidence of biological activity in the ocean. So how do we find that? Well, with a microgram of material, we're not going to be collecting cells. Okay. Typically on the Earth, you might get 10 to the 4 cells per cubic centimeter, maybe 10 to the 6 in, in waters on the Earth, and so the chance of getting a cell is, is nil. But what we want are the biological products of those cells that tell us that the chemistry that's going on is not abiotic chemistry that you could do in a chemistry lab or that nature did in meteorites 4 billion years ago, that it's biologically mediated. And so the way we do that is that we look for the abundances of various species that in their ratios and abundances tell us whether the inherent processes of life, processes that involve 
large information content, ability to use a very small number of basic building blocks to build structures, and the ability to drive the system, the system inside the cell, against the thermodynamic gradient and to overcome kinetic inhibitions. Those chemical clues are the things that we will look for, and those clues are the most universal tests that you can do. They don't assume anything about the morphology, about the uh, metabolism, about which molecules are carrying the information or anything like that. It's all about the fundamental difference between a biological system that has high information content and is capable of capturing and using free energy versus an abiotic system. So let me give you three examples of clues. And actually, um, Brent Sherwood in his talk on SILF earlier in the week showed these slides. Uh, so I'll go through them quickly. Uh, one possible test would be amino acids, building blocks of proteins. This uh, figure, which is uh, actually from Davila and McKay, shows four different samples, meteorites and some biologically mediated samples and then some relics uh, from the geologic record. We'll focus on the first four. Abundance versus four amino acids that are shown here in different colors. In the meteorites, the most abundant amino acid is glycine. And glycine is the easiest amino acid to form. It's also the amino acid with the least kinetic inhibition to overcome. So in abiotic systems, this, the most abundant amino acid is the one that's easiest to form, no surprise. The second most abundant is alanine, and that's the second easiest to form. And then in a kind of a Poisson tail, you've got the rest of these amino acids. Now, glycine and alanine are used in life, but they can't dominate in the system because you can't build proteins out of them. So life has to use and generate and synthesize more complex amino acids. And so in biological systems, you see that glycine and alanine no longer dominate that other amino acids do, and I'm only showing four out of the 22 for the Earth. So the signature of a biologically mediated factory of producing amino acids is very different from the signature of abiotic production, whether you look at a meteorite or make the amino acids in a laboratory by Miller-Urey experiment, for example. Second test. I've got a couple of time steps here. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is just pointing out the difference between life and non-life. Second test. All cells on Earth have membranes. Those membranes are needed to bring in energy-rich materials and to remove wastes. For example, to pump protons into the cell. Those membranes are made of organic materials, and they're made on the Earth of fatty acids with a head of something else, usually. The fatty acids have hydrocarbon tails, which are C, H, C, H, and so on. The numbers of carbons in those hydrocarbon tails and membranes are very distinct. In an abiotic system, if you make the equivalent of fatty acids abiotically, and you make these hydrocarbons, what you'll get is a plot like on the right, where if you plot the abundance of the various hydrocarbons versus the carbon number, the number of carbons, you get a beautiful Poisson distribution, and every carbon number is represented. If on the other hand, you look at bacteria, you look at their carbon numbers, what you find is that in bacteria, the hydrocarbon tails in the cell membranes are very strongly biased toward even carbon numbers. And that would not be a surprise if you asked what is the basic building block. And the answer is it's acetate, which has two carbon number, two carbons in it. So life bacteria use acetate as the building block for their membranes. Archaea, the other domain of microbes, uses isoprene, which has five carbons. So there you would get a predominance of carbon number divisible by five, C10, C15, C20, C25. Now, it doesn't matter if in Enceladus, organisms use those or they use a building block of three carbons or seven carbons or four carbons. The point is it will not look like the Poisson distribution that you see on the right. And then finally, very briefly, we do a very classic test for life, which is to look for the enrichment isotopically of light carbon, C12, 
which when you combine that measurement with the abundance of methane relative to other hydrocarbons and hydrogen relative to methane actually constrains for you, as in this plot, whether the system is biological or abiotic. So I've talked about three tests. There can be more, but you sample the plume multiple times. You see if these tests come out to be positive or negative. If they all come out to be positive, then you go back with more elaborate systems to actually try to capture these organisms and study them. If they all come out to be negative, maybe you go on to a different object in the Saturn system or elsewhere. It's possible you might end up with one or two of these being positive and one being not, and so in that ambiguous region, you would have to very carefully study what you got from the habitability results and try to piece together a story. But if there's life in the plume, this is what's going to happen. If there's life in the, in the ocean of Enceladus. But suppose that life isn't like earthly life. Suppose it doesn't use these particular uh, molecules as biomolecules. And, and the answer to that is that because we carry mass spectrometers, we will get a result regardless of what species are present in the biologically significant mass range from 100 out to 1,000. Because mass spectrometry is agnostic with respect to what molecules are actually present. If it's really bizarre, we'll see patterns in that really bizarre chemistry. It won't look abiotic, even if it doesn't look terrestrial. And that's the beauty of mass spectrometry. And this is a very, uh, this chart is hard to read, but I've included here a figure from a paper by Brent Sherwood and Acta Astronautica showing a, a potential exploration plan for Enceladus. A plume flyby mission, fly through mission like ELF, is really the first step. If ELF were to discover evidence of life, there would be a big push to go back and go back with uh, a sample return mission or go back with a lander or something like that. But before we invest in that, the fast track is to go and analyze the plume. And the remarkable point about this is that that first step allows you to discover life. It allows you to say in the first step of that exploration program, yes, there is evidence for life in the Enceladus ocean from the plume, or no, there isn't. Let me move on in the last five minutes or so to Titan. <clears throat> Titan is an enigma. It's a giant moon, the second largest moon in the solar system. It has a dense atmosphere of nitrogen and methane. Uh, it, it, by all of what Cassini has shown us, has a liquid water ocean from the gravity data, from looking at the tidal distortion. It may have the largest amount of liquid water in its interior because it's a much larger than Europa and has a thick ice mantle may have the largest reservoir of liquid water in the solar system, but because it is so massive, that ocean may be underlain by high-pressure ice rather than by rock, although there is evidence from Huygens probe data that that liquid layer is salty, and I won't go through the details of that evidence, and if that's so, then indeed this ocean may have had contact with rock in the past or somehow has contact with rock. But what's really remarkable about Titan is that the surface environment has a hydrologic cycle like that on the Earth, but because Titan's surface is so cold, 94 Kelvin, being nine and a half times farther from the sun than we are, it's methane that plays the role of the meteorological fluid rather than water. Huygens and Cassini have found uh, streams of methane, carved out gullies of methane, lakes and seas of methane, it rains methane, Cassini has observed that, there are clouds of methane that come and go, and in the high northern latitudes, in this image of uh, the high northern latitudes, you see these lakes and seas. Uh, the lakes are over here, this is Ligia Mare, the largest sea, Kraken Mare, and Punga Mare. And remarkably, Cassini's radar, uh, <clears throat> which was a facility instrument led by Charles Alachi, uh, was able to probe the composition of those seas. Rather than taking an image, as the radar is designed to do, by pointing to the side and penetrating through the haze of Titan, the radar on multiple flybys was pointed straight down. And as the radar passed over one of the seas, this is Ligia Mare, about 1,000 kilometers above the surface, it sent pulses at two centimeter wavelength and recorded the signal that came back. 
and over the sea itself, you get not one reflected signal, but two signals. This was all an idea that was first suggested by Giovanni Picardi of the University of Rome, now passed away. It was executed by Marco Mastro Giuseppe of uh, uh, the University of Rome for the radar team. And you see the reflection from the top, and you see a bottom reflection from the sea. And the time delay between the two tells you the depth of the sea, which in this case is 165 meters at its deepest point which, by the way, tells us that these hydrocarbon seas have hundreds of times more um, hydrocarbon in them than the oil and gas reserves on the Earth. But how do we know that they're actually hydrocarbon? Well, the marvelous thing about this experiment is that since you know the depth and you know the amplitude of the second signal coming back from the bottom, the attenuation of that signal from the top tells you uh, the absorption coefficient of the liquid. And these are really transparent liquids. Indeed, about the only liquids that are this transparent are nonpolar hydrocarbons and nitrogen. So bingo. You match the attenuation coefficient with liquid methane and a small admixture of its sister molecule, ethane. And so Cassini has not only probed the bathymetry of these seas, it has determined the composition for us remotely. So what's going on in these seas? These hydrocarbon seas show every evidence of having tides and so forth. Is there life there? Can life occur in nonpolar liquids? And the honest answer to this question is that nobody knows. It seems difficult, but some very clever ideas have been floated uh, by a number of young researchers I show here. Lucy Norman, who is at Imperial College and now is in Hong Kong, talked about vesicle containers involving phospholipids and hydrocarbons. James Stevenson, who graduated from Cornell last year, constructed a molecular model of an um, acrylonitrile uh, container about the size of a virus. And Martin Rahm, as a postdoc at Cornell, uh, constructed in a computer sheets of hydrogen cyanide polymers, there's HCN on Titan, um, which potentially, as sheets, could catalyze chemical reactions. So we don't know, but they're clever ideas, and we just have to go look. So do we go look at the seas uh, on the surface, or do we try to find um, material coming up from the ocean? And I think the answer is that there's one additional step that we must take. I would tend to go to the seas, but we also need to find out one other thing. We need to know if Titan's methane system has carved out channels all over the surface of Titan because from the radar data we have so far, because the radar is limited to about uh, 400 meter, 350 meters resolution, we only see very large channels on the surface and they're very sparse. But the Huygens probe, which landed, deployed from Cassini in 2004, landed in 2005 in January, took remarkable images of the surface. Here's a montage of those images from an effective altitude of 10 kilometers. And on the side of this hill, you see these dendritic channels, which are about 10 meters across, that because we have stereo imaging there, follow the topography beautifully. They are carved out by liquid, presumably liquid methane rain over time. This is the only place on Titan that we see this. Why is that? Because it's the only place on Titan we have very high resolution images, thanks to the Huygens probe, the European Space Agency probe. We need to go back to Titan to see if this kind of fluvial erosion has occurred throughout the crust over Titan's history. We need to map Titan at much higher resolution. And that, I think, will point the way for us to telling us how we go search for what would admittedly be very exotic life on Titan. So let me conclude. We know more about the habitability of Enceladus than any other body beyond the Earth, any other body beyond the Earth. And everything that Cassini has told us says that it has a habitable subsurface ocean. A simple Saturn orbiter, properly equipped, can tell us with mass spectrometers whether that ocean is actually inhabited. And that would break things open for future exploration to actually find and characterize that life. Titan, on the other hand, because of its exotic nature, is a test for the universality of life as an outcome of cosmic evolution. 
if the seas contain an exotic form of life, just as the Galapagos Islands contain exotic creatures, as Stephen Pine has said, what the Galapagos Islands did for the theory of evolution by natural selection, Titan might do for exobiology. So we have to go back. I haven't talked about Europa because I was tasked with talking about the Saturn system. It's a lunar-sized moon with a water ocean. We don't know yet whether it has organic molecules. We know it has salt. But the, <clears throat> the uh, Europa multi-flyby mission, which is uh, in the planning stages for launch in the 2020s, will tell us whether that ocean is as promising as the ocean of Enceladus. And with three bodies to explore in the outer solar system in this way, if we commit ourselves to doing that, we may well be able to answer the most profound question that we can ask in science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So we have uh, five minutes and about, looks like, 30 questions. So um, I'm going to suggest on Jonathan's behalf that after the session has to end uh, that he'll be available um, for more discussion. I know he loves to talk about this. So let's see. Um, there are several mission concepts for studying Titan's lakes. Are there suggestions for how to look for structures indicating possible life, such as azotosomes? Right, so the um, image that I showed from James Stevenson uh, of this acrylonitrile structure is an azotosome. And uh, one way that you would do that is you would look with mass spectrometry uh, for um, the, uh, a peak in the uh, mass spectrum corresponding to acrylonitrile. Uh, you could also possibly do some kind of microscopic imaging, although these are very small, they're virus, virus size. That would be kind of elaborate. So I would still go with mass spectrometry for those. How often does it rain on Titan? So it rains on Titan uh, seasonally. Uh, when Cassini arrived, it was raining in the south polar region. There were convective clouds, and the surface changed its brightness. As Titan moved toward equinox seven years later, uh, it began to rain in the equatorial region, and the surface darkened after the passage of clouds over an area of several million kilometers. So uh, these rains occur seasonally. All right. Um, any chance of examining plume fluid with a light microscope on ELF, looking for cells or structures? So it's a great idea. We're cost-constrained <clears throat> um, with these missions. Uh, it's certainly practical to put a microscope on. You would have to slow uh, the spacecraft down, possibly put it into orbit around Enceladus. That has planetary protection implications uh, if you want to be able to preserve these delicate structures. We like the flyby speeds we have in ELF of five kilometers per second. They're good for mass spectrometry, but not for light microscopy. So uh, with the kind of limited budgets one has in the discovery type missions, uh, we probably couldn't do that, but maybe in more expensive missions. Okay, uh, two questions, on, at least, on the same subject. If we find evidence of life on Enceladus, is there a case for declaring it a no-go zone and leaving it alone? Oh, well, um, if we discover life on Enceladus, uh, of course, if we find the evidence for biological processes, then you would go back. Uh, you'd have to use very high levels of cleanliness in any mission that involved landing on the surface. It would be category four. Uh, it would certainly then become a no-go zone for any sort of colonization activity that we heard about earlier in the week. But you wouldn't stop exploring. You would have to use the highest levels of planetary protection to, to explore this uh, habited ecosystem. Okay. Uh, how can ocean temperature and energy be measured through flyby? So temperature, there are a number of uh, what are called geothermometers. Uh, these are the ratios of certain... Uh, atomic species and molecular species that are actually used in geology uh, to measure temperatures and fluids. Uh, so we would uh, use those. And what was the other one? Temperature and? Uh, energy. Oh, so energy, so redox energy, you would look at the abundances of species that have a lot of hydrogen or reduced, species that have a lot of oxygen, uh, and you would then determine what the maximum potential is for these reacting with each other. Okay, uh, let's see, let's go to, back to Titan. Uh, does the subsurface ocean contribute, oh no, this is Enceladus, sorry. 
Does the subsurface ocean contribute to Enceladus sphericity, atypical for such a small planetary body? Um, it's actually the tidal heating, uh, and uh, yes, Enceladus is sort of at the threshold for a body that might or might not be irregular. It's 250 uh, kilometers in radius. On the other hand, Mimas is about the same size, and it's fairly spherical, but not quite as spherical as Enceladus. So the short answer is yes, it helps. Okay, let's see, uh, close to the end. Um, if ELF was about to make the measurements you described, um, now conclusive, do you think it'd be that we have detected life? Would anything be able to be determined about what type of life is there? So we would be able to determine, so first, yes, if those tests were positive, we would have detected life. Uh, if the biomolecules are amino acids and certain kinds of fatty acids, we would know the, the internal uh, composition of those cells. What are the molecules that make the membranes? What are the molecules that make the basic structure? We, we wouldn't know what the cells look like, but we'd know what they were made of. Which sounds like we'd need to go back. And then we need to go back. Again. All right, uh, let's see. I think this probably needs to be our final question in the interest of time. Sometimes when life is discovered in extreme environments on Earth, scientists are quick to assume that it may not just survive in those environments, but may have developed there. Isn't that too big an assumption? Maybe life originated elsewhere where conditions were right and then migrated and adapted. Well, yeah, so as far as extremophiles on the Earth go, I don't think the argument is that extremophiles actually formed in that extreme environment, because many of the adaptations are actually very sophisticated. The basic tool for determining how life, how all life is related is the phylogenetic tree, and it looks like life is essentially rooted in um, some sort of, uh, you know, both the bacterial and the archaeal systems, so life on Earth, as far as we understand, had a common origin, but that common origin goes way, way back. And in fact, Nick Lane, uh, who's a biochemist, has suggested that that universal common ancestor um, may have even lacked membranes. It may have required the use of uh, hydrothermal system mineral layers or surfaces uh, to actually bring material in and out. And then the bifurcation between bacteria and the archaea, which include the extremophiles, occurred really early on, and uh, then things went from there. But I, I think, you know, all, all biochemists agree there was a single separate origin a long, long time ago, and all life that we know of on Earth uh, shared that single origin. Uh, I'd certainly like to thank our audience for such uh, interesting questions and, in and uh, your interest in the topic. And please join me again in thanking our speaker, Jonathan.